Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's program. I'm sure we'll have more people joining us, uh, but I'm going to get started with our welcome intro. Uh, my name is Shay Quarry, and I serve as the programs manager for the DC Preservation League. I'm joined today by my fellow speakers, uh, Zachary Burt and Dr. Elizabeth Martin. For those of you who may be new to DCPL, we are Washington, D.C.'s citywide nonprofit founded in 1971 that is dedicated to preserving, protecting, and enhancing the historic built environment of the nation's capital. I have a few things to go over today before we get started. I'd like to start by taking a moment to acknowledge some of DCPL's top sponsors, whose annual financial support helps underwrite free programs like this one today. They are the D.C. Commission on the Arts and Humanities, Kutak Roth. Douglas Development Corporation and Tunovich Associates, Atlantic Refinishing and Restoration, Robert Benson Photography, Fire Blender Bell, Building Innovation Hub, Edens, EHC Traceries Inc., KCE Structural Engineers, Quinn Evans, and David Schwartz Architects. Thank you all for your dedication to historic preservation here in DC. This April, DCPL has been exploring uh, the presence of legacy businesses here in the district. We're really excited to launch this discussion here today uh, and share our findings alongside Dr. Elizabeth Morton, who has conducted um, different studies on this topic. Uh, if you have a question today, please use the Q&A box found at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we'll turn the chat on towards the end of the discussion as well, if you'd prefer to leave your question there. If you're joining us on Facebook, uh, you can just send your question directly to Zach or leave it in the comments and we will get to it on here on Zoom. Um, and now that we've covered that, I'm pleased to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Elizabeth Morton is a Washington DC based planning educator and consultant. She is currently the evaluation consultant for the Mellon Foundation funded Beyond Granite Project, an initiative of the Trust for the National Mall in partnership with the National Capital Planning Commission and the National Park Service. She's also an adjunct faculty member in the Urban Sustainability Program at the University of the District of Columbia. Zachary Burt is the Community Outreach and Grants Manager for the DC Preservation League. He is the staff liaison for the Landmarks Committee and the Government Affairs Committee and works with the Historic Districts Coalition. In addition to his work on historic landmark nominations, Zach manages DCPL's Preservation Initiatives Grants Program and the DC Historic Sites website. Prior to DCPL, Zach worked in government relations at a professional association. He has a BS in political science from the University of Utah and an MA in historic preservation from Goucher College. Uh, for me, I'm Shay Corey, I'm the programs manager. I oversee the education committee and work closely with community partners to plan the organization's events, uh, including lectures, walking tours, and webinars like this one today. I'm also responsible for DCPL's social media presence on Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube, LinkedIn, and any other place that we exist on social media. <laughs> Uh, and I have my master's in public history from American University, and I'll be presenting alongside Zach uh, for DCPL's portion of the event. Uh, so with all of that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and pass it over to Elizabeth so we can get started. All right. Thank you so much, Shay and Zach. I'm thrilled to be here. I'm really thrilled um, as a DC resident to hear about the burgeoning discussion uh, about legacy businesses. And thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, speak. I'll pull up my uh, slides. And Okay, everything coming through? Um, I am going to give you uh, the highlights from a national study that I've done uh, over the past five or six years. I've been really fascinated by this concept of legacy businesses. I did come out of the historic preservation field and was very interested in cultural heritage. Um, and today I'll give a little bit about why legacy businesses. I'm going to stay at a pretty broad uh, discussion level today. Um, talk about some of the early pioneers of this concept. I'll give an overview of that study I mentioned on legacy business initiatives across the United States. 
And I'll spend just a little bit of time talking about a prototype legacy business oral history project I did in Arlington, Virginia. So what is a legacy business? We have increasingly heard the term uh, used in the press in popular imagination. I'll talk a bit about all the different variations uh, that exist, but in general, I think the consensus is a longstanding independent business that has contributed something to community character and vitality. I will share some of the words of cities who have adopted legacy business programs and see if any of them are resonating with you, thinking about your own community and your own cherished institutions. Um, serial entrepreneurs, essential part of the brand of Miami, the bedrock of our community. So to some, this term legacy business connotes kind of an outdated business model. Um, but again, a growing number of communities are putting that label on Cherish Enterprise that they see as very much contributing to their life. So why do we care about legacy businesses? Um, just some of the general issues. Um, these are often community institutions. If you think about to you, what defines your community, it often revolves around the coffee shop you go to, for example. Um, they foster a sense of place and placemaking. We've all heard about the sustainability three-legged stool with economic sustainability, environmental sustainability. I would argue these legacy businesses are part of the social and cultural sustainability um, equation. Uh, these are often springboards and a lifeline for immigrant communities, helping to maintain traditions. Finally, an interesting uh, angle has come up when I've been doing uh, research on legacy businesses in uh, historically Black business corridors in particular, that often uh, legacy businesses are really the major source of equity, uh, intergenerational wealth, uh, in part because people are often excluded from uh, residential opportunities that were uh, shared by others in the community. Uh, just this weekend, there was an article um, about the power of weak ties in the New York Times, so I thought I would throw that in. Uh, and I was interested in another recent article as well from The Atlantic. You probably heard about the concept of third places, which are places besides the places you often are hanging out at work or at home. Uh, third places like uh, bookstores, hair salons, hangouts are places that you go um, to have the kind of interactions you might not have normally. Uh, you can expand your uh, horizon and establish a relationship without really a lot of baggage with, for example, a, a bartender or a barista. I was interested, again, this article on the left talking about weak ties. There's a famous article called The Strength of Weak Ties by Mark Granovetter, who talks about the cohesive power of, again, acquaintances. You may not know them very well, uh, but they're important to you and your well-being, the kind of people you might meet in a dog park, uh, the kind of people you might be sitting next to uh, at a hair salon. I was interested that both of these articles are framed in terms of health. Uh, so these can also be a, kind of part of our psychic well-being. And I think COVID has both reinforced and changed a lot of these concepts. Um, so from a preservation angle as well, why do we care about legacy businesses? Um, we all recognize there's a need for more inclusive community narratives. A uh, concept called the diversity deficit is often talked about. Um, where is, you know, despite our best efforts, the apparatus that we use in historic preservation tends to privilege the um, you know, resources that are, you know, have the traditional historic documentation, are in neighborhoods where people are familiar and enthusiastic about historic preservation. So legacy businesses are one way to uh, recognize uh, intangible and vernacular heritage. 
Uh, also, in general, the history of commercial resources is understudied. I'll give a little plug. I've been involved in an advisory capacity to a transportation research board study that will be released in the coming months where a um, consulting firm, not me, did an excellent job putting forward methods for evaluating post-World War II commercial structures and their historic significance. So take a look for that out for that. Um, so in preservation, what really can diversity, equity, inclusion mean? Um, it can mean, again, new types of resources, vernacular, intangible culture, meaning not focused just on a building, but on what goes on inside a building, uh, the social history of often overlooked groups. Are there different kinds of recognition beyond buildings and plaques and different kinds of policy tools beyond historic district review and, and normal listing? So let's see how legacy businesses might fit in. Um, San Francisco, again, I like to give them a lot of credit for their uh, really influential report that they did called Sustaining San Francisco's Living History back in 2014, which in many ways laid the groundwork for uh, legacy business programs across the country. Thinking about ways in their case in light of the tech boom and seeing a record number of small businesses close, which they thought really added a lot to San Francisco's uh, experience um, and tourism economy and quality of life, uh, they explored a variety of ways where uh, they could promote how do you preserve authenticity and living history. So legacy businesses was an outgrowth of that study. Um, in the words of the director at that time, they're trying to bridge the gap between what the market will command and what businesses can pay. And thinking about inspirational words again, uh, there was a recognition that the neighborhood businesses are the places that give the city its character. They're the bedrock of our community. Um, San Francisco Heritage uh, highlighted also some precedents uh, in Europe that I'll also highlight a few of and update. Um, in Paris, they have something called the Vital District Program, which was established in 2008. We all know in Europe, there's often a much stronger role of the state, and the state is often more willing to play a um, part in the market. So in this case, uh, the city actually buys retail spaces, and they rehab and operate them to specific kind of culturally significant businesses, such as bookstores, artisans, and bakeries in 11 predefined areas. So they've identified these kind of businesses as essential to their character, and they're trying to promote them. Um, I love this word blandification, um, which is, again, uh, trying to make sure that the enterprises that define and provide variety and texture to a community aren't overtaken by uh, chain stores. Uh, in London, uh, there's an Assets of Community Value program for pubs specifically. Um, this is an example of a nonprofit organization that really played a key role in promoting this initiative. There's something called the Campaign for Real Ale. So if these uh, pubs are nominated by a community, there's a variety of policies that help them out uh, in terms of uh, tax relief. Uh, there's a public awareness campaign. And again, um, with much more willingness to intervene in the market, um, there's a six month moratorium on the sale of these assets, giving the community right to bid on them. Uh, Barcelona has another great example where they expanded their preservation policies specifically to include intangible resources. Again, think about cafes, festivals. Um, it began uh, with a Forever Beautiful initiative with Trek and Eisen promoted businesses over 50 years old that had retained character. And in the highest category now, it allows the city the right of first refusal if the property is put on the market. So back to San Francisco, again, um, this initiative really was popularized by a nonprofit organization, San Francisco Heritage. They started a crowdsourced 
Legacy Bars and Restaurants program. Um, again, and got 100 nominations quickly, established a sticker, a marketing program, a map to try to raise awareness of the significance of these institutions. And they actually in San Francisco passed uh, Proposition J, which provided uh, seed funding for the grants um, that now exist in San Francisco. So the public uh, actually agreed to, um, to promote funding for this program back in 2015, which again laid the groundwork for the whole rest of the uh, leading program in the United States. I'll come back to San Francisco later, but it also established the first legacy business registry uh, in 2015. To be eligible for the registry, businesses must be 30 years or older or 20 if they're at the risk of displacement, have contributed to the neighborhood's history, agree to maintain their identity name and craft. Uh, these are nominated by the mayor or board of supervisors and the Historic Preservation Commission is also involved in advising on um, legacy business registry entries uh, to the Small Business Commission. So most communities uh, do not have such a robust uh, program as San Francisco, uh, but increasingly, as I'll show you in a minute, um, more and more cities are joining um, the cadre of, of people with programs. I did this uh, publication for the American Planning Association. I think it was published in early 2021 and almost immediately got outdated because uh, you know I have a press search on and there's just constantly either programs being discussed um, or um, under study or established. Um, so I'll, I'll give you just a kind of a broad overview of what I found. So who initiates a legacy business program? Um, you saw in that last example that the uh, initiation of the concept was from a nonprofit organization. And that actually also has been the case in a number of cities. Uh, often this just remains a nonprofit advocacy group effort, uh, but there are programs like you see here on the right, uh, Long Beach Legacy Business. I think just last week, the city adopted legislation which sort of adopted uh, Long Beach uh, Heritage, which is a nonprofit organization's uh, own registry, a lot of their own um, uh, recommendations for tools. The Los Angeles Conservancy is a similar example where they maintained their own legacy business registry. Uh, and then ultimately with awareness building and political support, uh, the city adopted its own program. I'm sorry, my dog is barking. Um, also newspapers, I found a couple of cases where actually newspapers or other kind of boosters like the Chamber of Commerce or Main Street that have awards um, and sometimes with audio uh, components, um, sometimes with annual ceremonies. Um, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, there are also a number of cities that use the concept of legacy businesses to divert some of the um, public money that they got to legacy businesses, especially if you can picture all of the public facing um, customer oriented venues. In this case, I've highlighted Austin, um, the arts venues, bars and live music places that give such a unique contribution uh, to the city who were exactly the ones at risk when uh, we were all not doing those things. So the number of cities that have used the um, COVID-19 money specifically to funnel to what they consider a legacy business. Um, again, thinking about the public sector, you see up at the top, um, the first really substantial program in San Francisco uh, was started in 2015. As the years have gone by, you see more and more 2022, 2023, a variety of kinds of cities with different sorts of motivations. Sometimes they're small towns and their businesses might be dying. More often, their businesses, their communities that are experiencing rapid growth 
uh, worried about that issue of displacement, blandification, erasure of cultural identity, um, and there are others in the works. I'm going to give you sort of an overview of what, rather than lots and lots of charts, an overview of what kinds of promotional policy tools cities are offering to their legacy businesses. Um, and I want to stress again, I've, I was speaking to Shannon, uh, to Shay about this. Um, every community is unique, and that's what I find interesting. There isn't just one template for establishing a program. Um, communities are looking specifically at what's the issue in their neighborhood, uh, what do businesses need, what kind of political uh, policy tools are available, whether legally uh, or politically, what has public support. Um, so I want to stress that there's nothing necessarily here that's a model for everybody to adopt. Um, I teach a lot of uh, public policy related to design and preservation, so I sort of snuck in one of the slides I like to use about uh, public policy in general. When you're facing a, a policy issue, um, typically, and we know this so well in historic preservation, uh, there are different degrees of, um, of coercion, for lack of a better word, going from lightest to heaviest. We rely a lot just on information. Uh, this, this particular paradigm is called the three E's, education uh, that might later lead to selective incentives, which they call engineering, and only then may progress to rules and regulations. Um, so building up legitimacy in stages, uh, there are many communities that don't just come right out and allocate $10 million to legacy businesses. There needs to be a sort of education campaign first, uh, get people familiar with what the idea even means. And also, I think we all recognize that not all of these stages are right for all kinds of resources. Um, so legacy business registry is a real common denominator among all these cities in general. Uh, surveys and registries, as we know in preservation, are a foundation for sound public policy. But these registries also um, can achieve awareness raising similar to historic district nominations, both for the conductors of the surveys and the general public. Uh, can be education for policymakers, be a source of pride and identity building, uh, possibly, as I'll speak about in a minute, a link to other policy tools like incentives, and possibly a way to prioritize resources if you're dealing with a big issue. Um, recognition of the contribution of uh, legacy business and um, having put it on the registry um, can be one advantage. Um, thinking about variations between programs, again, there's no one set template. Uh, age in general, um, what I see as sort of the median age is about 25 or 30 years. I've seen as little as 10 and as high as 50. Um, some communities think about the size. Do you wanna cap uh, the number of employees at say 20 or 100? Uh, some communities uh, feel strongly that nonprofits should be recognized as a legacy business, even though it's not your typical enterprise. Uh, chains often uh, people try to discourage chains. It was funny when I did this program in Arlington, starting to look at, well, what's 30 years old? I mean, Starbucks now is often uh, 30 years old. So uh, I know Cambridge, Massachusetts has a provision for chain lets, where if you're sort of a local oriented chain and you only have four shops, you know, you can, you can count. Uh, often, um, even though often, interestingly, these programs come out of economic development, they sometimes come out of historic preservation offices, I've seen it coming out of uh, economic opportunity and inclusion, but often from an economic development angle. Um, but even though the, that is the office that sponsors these programs, they talk about the necessity for a business on the legacy business registry to contribute something 
to local heritage and perhaps even demonstrate some commitment to retaining that heritage. Uh, I've seen communities recently that are really trying to target either areas uh, vulnerable to displacement, like you saw San Francisco did, or possibly with um, a targeted area median income. So what kind of tools are available to businesses once they get on the legacy business registry? Again, this varies from place to place. Um, some of those softer uh, or some of the more robust and possibly powerful uh, tools are incentives like funding. Uh, there are communities like uh, Arlington where I worked where they just don't give uh, money uh, to businesses at all. Um, in lieu of money, uh, there can be targeted uh, technical assistance based on what a community uh, feels especially uh, vulnerable about. Uh, priority consideration for certain kinds of programs. Uh, I've seen actually, this is sort of a business organization in Birmingham, but then they have a loan fund, but they give a slightly lower interest rate if you're on, you know, if you're a legacy business. Cities do a lot um, that they may be able to modify but, uh, to make favorable to legacy businesses. Um, some cities are exploring uh, procurement policies, for example. One of my favorite examples is Cambridge, Massachusetts that puts legacy business information on their bike share stations. So there's things cities are doing anyway that maybe don't require a lot of money. Um, some cities are thinking about or have instituted programs that assist with negotiating long-term lease agreements. And a big issue I saw, I did an article about um, legacy business efforts in Black-owned business districts, like I mentioned, and this idea of succession planning. Um, there's a fear of this uh, issue of the silver tsunami of baby boom retirement. So a lot of business owners uh, in the coming decade are uh, predicted to retire. They may not have a family. We romanticize, oh, the son will want to take over, but that may not be the case. Um, so there, there are organizations that are trying to uh, explore employee ownership programs since the employees have uh, worked there, they've internalized the traditions, um, they know how the business works, they know how the community works. So even if you don't have an heir, a son or a daughter to pass along your business to, uh, employee ownership is one uh, option. Uh, and again, thinking about the, uh, the softer tools, uh, cities are doing promotion, social media, maps. Uh, a number of cities produce videos for legacy businesses and keep them on the city website. Award ceremonies, all these things are not, um, they're not free, but they're not really that expensive and they're ways to raise awareness. Uh, Durham, North Carolina um, has one kind of networking opportunity, uh, which is something that many cities do and I love the way they phrase it. They call it a legacy business masterclass. So it's again, recognizing the, um, the knowledge and the skills and the connections that people have to their community, allowing them to share that with each other um, and connecting them also to the city and to city programs. Um, so going back to San Francisco, because again, it's got the hugest program um, for businesses. They have a legacy business grant. They do marketing and promotion plaques. They have a dedicated staff member. Um, also for landlords, they have a program that allows, that um, gives rent stabilization grants if a landlord will uh, extend a lease for at least 10 years if you're on the legacy business registry. So thinking about what's the long-term implications of this, I've stolen two slides, so I'm giving him a big credit here to, um, to Richard Carrillo, who I 
um, spoke with on a panel a couple months ago, because um, I don't want to misspeak for public policy. So I, I've taken his two slides verbatim, these next two. So again, thinking about um, city processes, uh, there was a case study of a legacy business in San Francisco where the business argued to the planning commission that a development project would jeopardize the viability of the legacy business because it would cast shadows on the beer garden. So this um, uh, caused the planning commission to vote to shave five feet off the proposed building and to try to, to get the developer to try to make the rooftop more transparent. Other things they're thinking about, again, thinking about how to integrate legacy businesses with public policy, um, some permit streamlining or tax breaks. Uh, Rick was telling me something about a policy where um, legacy businesses are exempt from a certain kind of uh, storefront combination requirement or something. So clearly this had become uh, an issue voiced by some legacy businesses. Um, possibly city departments patronizing legacy businesses, um, legacy business commercial mortgage perhaps, working with bank loans and SBA loans. Um, so even city ownership of property, again, these are all potential things that San Francisco, which is by far the most aggressive city, um, is thinking about. So I'm just going to talk for a couple minutes about this project I did with graduate students uh, in Arlington. This was a prototype project where we looked at two communities that were um, predicted to undergo big changes uh, in the coming uh, 20 years. Uh, Langston Boulevard, formerly known as Lee Highway, uh, in Green Valley, a historically African-American neighborhood. So we looked at what were some common challenges. Um, I wanna also do a call out for frame shops. We tend to think about legacy businesses as bars and restaurants, um, but really fascinating in our, our research and in our um, dealings with the community. Um, I never thought about the contribution a frame shop makes. If you, they say like, why do you come to a frame shop? You're framing a sonogram or a diploma or your wedding photo. And we sit there and we do it in front of you and we discuss it with you. Um, it's all of these sort of special moments of your life. Uh, dry cleaners was another example, of which I was shocked at like, I warn you, your dry cleaner is watching you, but they, you know, people bring in their wedding dresses. They leave things in their pockets. Um, all of these sort of face-to-face -face interactions that you get. Um, so anyway, this uh, wonderful uh, KH Art and Framing Company, when we interviewed them, they talked about how busy they are when you go in. It's a challenge to really even interview legacy business owners because they're so busy working. Um, but trying to make the time to do social media uh, and all of the things that you're expected to do these days um, is really a challenge for legacy businesses. Um, I was going to take this out because of DC, um, but it's an example of looking again at your specific community, um, a common challenge in Arlington, which is trying to densify and become more urban, uh, is parking. There are some legacy businesses that say, again, another frame shop, uh, we need we need parking, or there's a perception that legacy business can be at odds uh, with, with good planning. Um, and I'm just going to close by uh, playing you a couple of excerpts from these oral history projects um, that we did. Um, again, this was a prototype project. We have these up on websites. Transcripts of these legacy business interviews are in Arlington's uh, Center for Local History. One of my students here you see on the left, Valeria Gelman, a huge shout out for her. She wove some of these together uh, and made an independent media radio series um, called The Local Shop. And I just wanna close 
quickly with playing, if you remember this first slide, this is the family that founded um, Lebanese Taverna, which is of course super successful now. I think they have 12 locations, you know, one at the airport, um, but talking to them about how they started was really uh, enlightening. So I'm gonna pull up a different screen and see. Let me see if I can manage this. Here we go. Okay, so I'll just show you one example of the kind of stories. Then in uh, 1979, my father found out that this little shop on the corner of uh, McKinley and Washington Boulevard was um, for sale. It was owned by a Greek family. At that time, it was called the Athenian Taverna. So um, my older siblings, who at that time were at Yorktown High School, helped my dad uh, negotiate the lease and because his English was pretty poor. So um, he helped negotiate the lease and uh, the first uh, restaurant was uh, opened in my, for my family. Um, we didn't have enough money to change the whole sign. Hence was born Lebanese Taverna because Taverna is actually a Greek word. That means, you know, small restaurant. We don't use that in Lebanon, but um, it was born out of necessity. Uh, and the menu was not Lebanese at first. We continued selling the pizzas and subs and such, but we would have Lebanese food for dinner. And, you know, that's where our family ate. And customers uh, would come in and see us eating hummus and kebabs. And and they're like, wait a minute, we want that. We want pizza. <laughs> so uh, within the first year, the menu got converted. It started. Okay. So, um, I'm just going to close there thinking about the origin stories of places. Um, you know, an anecdote I'll leave you with one of my graduate students who said, before I, you know, took this class and started thinking about it, you know, this was my relationship to a business. I would walk out of the metro, I'd get my app, I'd order the coffee, I'd walk in and I'd take it and, and leave without even a thought to the personal kind of interaction that was possible and the legacy that resides in this enterprise. And I think what you're doing, just sort of even promoting the term legacy business and talking about it uh, is exciting. And I, I hope, I wish you success in promoting that in uh, DC. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Yeah, and I know thank you so much. Yeah, we've had such a great, uh, you know, time inter just interacting with these different businesses. And so we're excited to, to share a little bit about what DCPL has been doing um, for the past two months. Um, I think it's been two months, uh, but I will share our PowerPoint. Uh, if you didn't know, uh, DCPL has put out uh, a legacy business report. Um, I think Zach is going to drop a link to that um, in the chat as well, if you would like to, to read through it. Um, we'll present um, a lot of the information today, but you can also just read more information and find more resources uh, in the physical report. So we've been uh, doing a lot of different things this month. We've had, um, two, this is our second event. Our first event was at uh, the Potter's House, uh, which has been around since 1960 and is a really great uh, community center, but we have been looking at researching, analyzing uh, the presence of legacy businesses in the district, and we've been doing that uh, based off of the following criteria. So we've been looking at uh, businesses that have been operating for 20 years um, and that are located within the boundaries of DC and that they've contributed to the community's history. They're not affiliated with a corporate uh, national chain, so local chains have been included, um, and they have been closed for no more than four years. Um, and the reason the four years uh, is, is present is because of COVID. So most legacy business programs uh, allow for two years of closure, but with COVID, we were finding that particularly in DC, uh, you know, businesses had been closed 
for at least part of COVID or most all of COVID. So we expanded that to four years. Um, and these aren't currently, um, you know, super strict. We're still in the process of determining, you know, where DCPL's place is in this conversation in the district. Uh, but we're really excited to just talk about the legacy businesses that we found. And we do believe that they are really important to the historical cultural fabric of DC uh, and that there is a role for preservationists uh, to play in this conversation. And so if you know of a business that meets those criteria, uh, you can submit, submit it online. We are trying to do a bit of crowdsourcing ourselves. Uh, we're trying to gather information and figure out what exactly uh, would work the best in DC. Um, you know, Elizabeth talked about all of these different ways that legacy business programs and legacy businesses can be treated and explored in, in all these different cities. Uh, but those programs come about in form in response to the city's culture and the city's geography. And so if you know of a business, please tell us about it. Uh, you know, we're a small staff. And so we're always looking for community input because we can't be everywhere all at once. Um, and so if you know of a place, please just, just let us know, submit it. I think Zach has put that in the chat as well, the submission form. Uh, and I will let him uh, talk to us about why specifically DCPL is involved uh, in this conversation. Yeah, thank you, Shay. And also thank you to Dr. Morton for that really interesting presentation. I, I learned a lot um, and I thought I already knew a lot about legacy businesses, but I learned even more today. So um, DCPL is involved for various reasons. First of all, is people-focused preservation, which um, the overall historic preservation field has moved towards. And um, DCPL would also like to lead that charge as well, because we realize that's critical um, to historic preservation in the 21st century. Um, documentation for future preservation efforts. I mean, Elizabeth's um, oral history that she shared from Lebanese Taverna, I mean, that's exactly the, the kind of stuff that we think um, legacy businesses can cover. Um, we had an event at the Potter's House in Anna's Morgan on Saturday. Um, and a lot of what the panel was saying would also be great in an audio format. And um, I think they're also interested in doing more with their oral history as well. So we had a good conversation there on Saturday as well at that event. Um, it adds to neighborhood and historic districts, history, culture, character, and identity. Um, this definitely goes along with what Elizabeth was talking about with the intangible and vernacular, uh, that social value, um, as you see in the next one, social history and diversity. Um, obviously, there's a quote unquote diversity deficit that Elizabeth touched on um, in preservation. It's improving, but um, it's not anywhere near where it needs to be. Um, so that's another important aspect of this with the more um, that history that's more in the recent past that um, within the past five decades rather than after 50 years. And then um, businesses obviously are great owners and stewards of historic properties. You see a lot of adaptive reuse um, with these properties. And sometimes it's not so much a total change in use, but you know, um, three or four different restaurants that have always been on the same corner or something along those lines. So um, there's a lot of different areas in here for why DCPL is involved in this um, historic preservation endeavor. And so um, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but uh, this year we're featuring five businesses. We would love to feature more in the coming years, hence why uh, we shared the link in the chat um, and feel free to share that link uh, far and wide so we can get uh, really good submissions here. Uh, Cause like Shay said, um, we're a small staff. So we need all the intel we can get about different businesses that are important to your neighborhood and your particular uh, part of DC. Um, so you can see these features in our report. Uh, we're also posting about them on social media. And then I also just wanna give a quick plug for a tour that we're gonna be leading this coming Saturday uh, that you can register for on our website. Uh, we will be covering some of these businesses. We'll be starting over at Lee's Flower Shop over at about, I believe that's about 11th and U and then moving west and south towards DuPont Circle. So we'll be going through the Greater U Street, Greater 14th Street, and then the DuPont Circle Historic Districts and talking about some of the businesses that make those historic districts uh, unique. Uh, next slide, please. I'm trying. There you oh, go. <laughs> no worries. So um, the first one was Annie's Paramount Steakhouse. 
um, which has actually been around since 1948. They um, later on they moved to the space that is now JR's, which is a gay bar uh, between P and Q on uh, 17th Street. Uh, but now, and then in the late 80s, they moved up to where they are today across from the Safeway and DuPont Circle. Um, it was started by uh, the children of Greek immigrants, um, the Katinas family. And um, it's actually named for one of the sisters, Annie Katinas. Um, and it's actually a really interesting business because it's one of the few current restaurants that's actually listed in the DC Inventory of Historic Sites. Um, it was added in 2020. Uh, another one, just for your reference, is the Tabard Inn over on, um, I believe that's N Street off Connecticut, also in the DuPont Circle Historic District. And Annie's has really been an institution within DC's um, LGBTQ plus community um, really since about probably the 1960s. And um, also when we do our tour this Saturday, we're going to be ending at Annie's because they will be having a 75th anniversary event. So uh, when Shay and I were exploring legacy businesses and they said, oh, um, we're actually doing our 75th anniversary in April when you guys are doing legacy businesses, we thought that was uh, pretty cool. So we're going to be incorporating that into the tour as well. And so it's a good opportunity to uh, support Annie's and um, enjoy some of the festivities they're going to have there. Yeah, and I think, you know, one thing that that Zach and I have been speaking about as well um, has been just how great these interactions have been with the business owners and to speak to one of Elizabeth's earlier points, uh, you know, you go into a business, you take, you buy something and you leave, um, but getting to speak with the actual owners of these establishments, uh, you know, it has been a little bit difficult to, to be able to speak with them because they are so busy, but uh, it's really, you know, and they're, they're really excited about uh, the, the ideas behind this, you know, potential programming as well. Uh, so moving on, we also have Ben's Chili Bowl, uh, which was established in 1958. Very, uh, you know, well known, not a not a hidden gem by any means, but still a gem. Uh, it's in the Greater U Street Historic District. Uh, it's obviously been a center for Black community in D.C. Uh, for many, many years, um, you know, even really closely uh, tied to its establishment uh, in the 60s. Um, you know, there were a lot of famous uh, Black performers uh, located on Black Broadway. Um, and so they had a lot of different performers. Uh, we got to speak with Virginia Ali, who's one of the original founders of Bend Chili Bowl. Uh, and she <laughs> is such a great storyteller. And she was talking about how, uh, you know, performers would come to Ben's because while they could perform downtown, like Nat King Cole could perform downtown in DC, but because of segregation, he couldn't eat anywhere there. So he would come to Ben's Chili Bowl and eat um, and Martin Luther King would come in and eat chili cheeseburgers and drink milkshakes and talk about uh, the marches he was planning downtown, um, which they they went to attend as well. So uh, and it was one of the only uh, one of three businesses, including Lee's Flower Shop in the Industrial Bank of Washington um, to survive the 1968 riots um, following uh, Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s death. So um, really, you know, phenomenal history. There's, there's so much that she said that I, that I could share. Um, and we'll be posting um, information from that interview uh, this week on LinkedIn, if you'd like to read that article. Um, but really, you know, the people start talking and you realize um, how important these businesses are, not just to the present, but also to the past. And so it's been really great um, to speak with them. Um, and then for Miss Pixies, we also got to speak with her, uh, established in 1997. Uh, it's located in the Greater 14th Street Historic District. And I would say most of the businesses that we've inventoried so far are either located in a historic district or, or are located in a building that was constructed uh, more than 50 years ago. So um, again, just tying it back to built environment and significance. Um, in terms of traditional historic preservation uh, concerns. Uh, Miss Pixies is great. If you haven't been in there, uh, you should definitely take a look. Um, it's this really eclectic uh, furniture antique store. And um, she puts on, you know, she has local artists that uh, have their work hanging on the walls for sale. Um, she's previously done, uh, you know, plays, community theater groups, um, different types of parties and memorial services. Um, 
you know, she had one customer come in and say uh, she's moved a few times in the district, but they stated that uh, she had moved the store and they missed uh, their space of meditation. So she's <laughs> she's got a great personality. You know, people come in just to talk with her. And, um, you know, it's just it's really emblematic of, of community space uh, and being a third place where people feel free to have casual conversations, come in and not you know, necessarily need to, to purchase anything to be able to feel a sense of community, have a conversation, uh, or just feel like they're a part of something outside of, of work and home. Yeah, and as I mentioned, um, we had an event at the Potter's House this last Saturday. Uh, this is Andrea Lewis in the photo. She's the executive director there, and she has um, been a great partner on the programming we've been doing. And she led the panel on Saturday at the Potter's House. Uh, Potter's House has been located on Columbia Road since 1960. So it's had a very long time presence in the Annis Morgan neighborhood as you kind of move over towards Mount Pleasant and Columbia Heights. Um, I think Potter's House very much encapsulates kind of the overall vibe and history of Annis Morgan because it's always been a community that's kind of been at the forefront of social justice and. Um, those particular kinds of issues. Um, Potter's House actually has its roots with the Church of the Savior. And more or less, the story goes, going back to Reverend Gordon Cosby, who was the founder of the church, um, is that they, they went up to a church in New Hampshire um, in either, I think it was the late 1950s, and they felt like the, the church was just kind of cold and lonely, but then they stayed over a tavern um, that evening, and the tavern was very lively. And so they liked the idea of a tavern being kind of this um, place to come together and have that same kind of spirituality that you would have in a church, but just a little bit more lively and making those connections in kind of a community space. Um, so over the years, though, um, the Potter's House has expanded and had a lot of spinoffs of different nonprofits, um, which they also call ministries. Um, they've had Jubilee's Jobs, uh, or rather Jubilee Jobs, Jubilee Housing, Sarah Circle, Christ House, Samaritan, in Academy of Hope, Joseph's House, if you've ever walked around Lanier Heights or Adams Morgan, maybe some of those names sound familiar. Um, the Potter's House was kind of the original and then those have spun off and done a lot of social services for different communities, whether the formerly incarcerated or um, Latinx immigrants or the LGBTQ community. Um, they've had a presence and contributed to the neighborhood and those communities. Um, one thing that really is just so just wild to me is that um, before the pandemic, they were providing about 10 free meals a month. Um, at, like in the past three years, they provided 65,000 free meals uh, to people in not only Adams Morgan, but just the wider Washington, D.C. community. Um, and so I think that's really incredible. But as I talked about all those all these social services, they also still have the coffee house. Um, and a bookstore, which is really great. And the titles are curated to kind of fit the overall theme um, in history of the Potter's House. So definitely worth stopping by if you're up on Columbia Road. And then the last one we have here is Diego's Hair Salon in the DuPont Circle Historic District. Um, Diego D'Ambrosio and his wife, uh, Rosaria, they came to the U.S. in 1961 to work for an Italian diplomat. Um, over time, um, he got involved with hairstyling. He originally had a song called Hollywood Men's and Women's Hairstylist, which was Kitty Corner over in the DuPont Circle Hotel building right there at Q and 19th. And um, then they, you know, moved to the current spot, been around since 1968. Um, if you've ever been in there or walked by, you've seen many of the pictures on the wall of famous people that have had their hair done there. Um, we talked to one of his sons, Fabrizio, who now co-manages the space with the other brother, Marco. And Fabrizio was telling us how his father um, cut uh, Warren Berger's hair and uh, William Rehnquist's hair. So he um, was definitely in the D.C. circuit of uh, famous individuals, not only diplomats, but people here in the U.S. government. So I like, um, yeah, unofficial barber of the Supreme Court is a good way to put it. Um, and he was very involved in the DuPont Circle community. And then in 2010, they actually ceremonial, ceremonially um, named that portion of Q Street, uh, Diego, Diego D'Ambrosio Way, um, and the mayor was there and everything. So um, next time you're over in DuPont Circle, um, 
if, maybe if you don't get a haircut, at least maybe peek through the window and you can see all the pictures on the wall. Oh, and Shade, wasn't this, oh, go back real quick. Wasn't this um, his particular chair that he would cut hair at? And you can see where there's kind of that, what would you call it, patina? I guess you'd say in historic preservation on the floor there, <laughs> where it's kind of worn away. Mm -hmm, yeah, it's kind of, you can't really see it in this photo, but it's a, like almost a horseshoe shape where he would walk uh, and cut cut hair and that's his chair. Um, he passed away in 2021. 20, I believe. Yeah, that sounds right. Um, but they, they, they've kept his chair there. Um, and so I know we're, we're getting really close to the end of time. Um, so if you have a question, go ahead and, and throw it in the Q&A. Um, but if you, you know, please submit a business if you know of one um, or email uh, info at dcpreservation.org if you have specific questions um, about, you know, what we're doing next or, or what we've already done. <laughs> Um, and then, of course, follow us on, on social media. That's where we keep keep everything the most up to date or try to, um, largely through LinkedIn. We do most of our articles um, and longer, you know, research writings on, on LinkedIn. And um, it's, it's not quite a question, but we had an interesting comment on Facebook. And uh, Dr. Morton might be familiar with this, maybe not. Um, I don't know how recent it is, but uh, the Senior Director of Advocacy at the LA Conservancy, which is the leading nonprofit in Los Angeles County, um, they commented and they said, California has introduced legislation in the current session to establish a statewide legacy business registry and initiative as a companion to the citywide ones like San Francisco and LA, which Elizabeth mentioned. If passed, we believe it will be the first in the nation. Also, in addition to LA's new program through the city, the current Conservancy's initiative includes small grants offered through funding provided by Wells Fargo, which I believe they've been doing that now for a few years. But that statewide legislation, that's pretty interesting. Yeah, thank you for that. I got contacted at one point and I got my wisdom teeth out that day, so I wasn't able to talk to the person. But that's exciting that it's progressing. I didn't know if that, in fact, um, had gone forward. So thanks for sharing that. And, and uh, kudos to you for all of your super, super work promoting. Thank you. We do, we have a question. Uh, it's for both DCPL and for Dr. Morton. Uh, beyond visiting and supporting these businesses directly, is there anything the public can do to further legacy business efforts? Uh, yeah, Elizabeth, <laughs> anyway. Elizabeth, go on. And and yeah. then maybe I'll add something. Yeah, I mean, patronize them. Consider, again, um, I didn't mention this cab uh, company that you think is a really obsolete business, but um, in interviewing him, he told the story about how, you know, in segregated Virginia, this cab company was established to transport expecting mothers into DC because they couldn't go. And it, you know, it makes me, you know, when I'm over there, patronize that cab company, even though I can, you know, take an Uber. So, you know, part of it is just trying to re-examine your relationship between, you know, convenience and price. And I mean, that, that it's kind of a small example, but, you know, talking about it at an individual level, you know, can, can have an impact. Yeah, I was, I was just going to add to because I think that's a great response. I was also going to say that, I mean, feel free to let your elected representatives know that there's interest in this, because I, I think it's always kind of been talked about in D.C. government of getting more involved with the legacy business program. But I think unless if people aren't mentioning it, I don't really see it getting a lot of traction. So, um, yeah, contact your council member or bring it up to your ANC or um, whoever your local representative is. And I'll say just, you know, on our end for, for DCPL or other, you know, nonprofits or, or history organizations that highlight legacy businesses, um, you know, show up like coming to this webinar is great because there's a lot of, um, you know, background tracking of, of what people are interested in. And so the more uh, you show up and, and, you know, proclaim that interest, the more uh, organizations are able to, um, you know, show that there is interest and in that they should be dedicating um you know time effort energy towards towards these kinds of initiatives um so you're already doing it <laughs> by yeah, coming to that's important. Yeah. yeah for continuing these types of programming yeah mm -hmm. 
Well, if we don't have any other questions, we are at, at 102. So I'd like to, to thank everyone for coming. And uh, I thought this was a great uh, discussion and I'm glad that um, hopefully well, there'll be more to come. So we'll, <laughs> we'll, keep, we'll keep updated on that. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you, Dr. Martin and Zach uh, yeah, for you. speaking with me today. And I hope everyone has a great day. Bye, everyone.